Good evening. It's a joy to welcome you to another one of our midweek Bible studies. This evening, we're in the eighth chapter of John, one of my favorite passages in the entire New Testament. Uh, chapter seven concluded with, as we saw last week, the crowd deeply divided about Jesus's identity and his teaching. Some wanted to seize him, and when actually the temple officials returned to the chief priest and, and the Pharisees who'd sent them, they're asked why they had not arrested Jesus. They respond in verse 46 with words that echo the same sense of amazement at Jesus' teaching that had been expressed by others previously when they say, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. And the Pharisees express their concern that these officials maybe have also been led astray by Jesus. And John reintroduces us briefly at this point to Nicodemus, the Pharisee and the leader who had come to Jesus by night, uh, that we read about that encounter in John chapter 3, the story about the uh, Jesus telling him about the necessity to be born again. And Nicodemus here uh, warns about hastily judging the Lord without hearing him out, says the law forbids us to do that. And they, the fellow Pharisees, begin to mock Nicodemus, say, well, you're not from Galilee as well, are you? And remind him that no prophet comes from Galilee. Well, chapter 7 concludes with the statement that everyone went home. But as we come to chapter 8, Verse 1 indicates that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and we know that he often spent the time there praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And verse 2 tells us that the next morning early, he returned to the temple and resumed his teaching, and a crowd had gathered to hear him. And it's, this, it's at this point that our focal lesson begins in verse 3 with the statement that the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman to Jesus who had been caught in the very act of adultery, and they set her before him in the center of this courtyard area. The word caught or seized uh, suggests an arrest that involved some force as they brought her to Jesus. And we don't know the details of the arrest or who it was that had detected her adulterous actions. Perhaps it was her husband. We're really not told for sure. Interestingly enough, the man involved in this illicit relationship isn't also brought before Jesus, although the Old Testament law demanded the death penalty for both parties who were guilty of adultery. We read that in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. Well, it raises the question, why was she singled out when the man wasn't brought before the Lord as well? Well, the accusers address Jesus here not with the term rabbi or master, but with the word teacher. He's certainly engaged in teaching, but perhaps their use of the term was to uh, design to lessen his authority in their own eyes. And it's clear from what follows and what John will tell us later that they are attempting to entrap Jesus with their words. Now, they don't identify the woman by name, simply choosing to refer to her as this woman. They go on to say that she's been caught in the very act of adultery, but they fail to supply any witnesses as required by the law to make a legitimate accusation. And in verses 5 and 6, the adversaries go on to lay their trap for Jesus, stating that Moses and the law had commanded that such women be stoned. And again, in their hypocrisy, they ignore the role of the man who was involved in this adulterous affair and single out the woman for punishment. Now they ask Jesus to express his opinion on what should be done to her. And John makes it clear in verse 6 that they're doing so to find some basis or grounds on which to accuse him. They're basically presenting Jesus here with a no-win situation, something that they would do later as they question him about paying taxes to Caesar or not, trying to, uh, to discredit him. Here the idea is that he will either have to affirm the law of Moses and thus open himself to charges of being heartless and callous toward the plight of this woman, or he'll have to declare that the law doesn't apply to her and thus condone her sinfulness. And, if Jesus condemns her, he may well lose the support of the crowd who would deem him as lacking in mercy. He would also open himself up to accusations that he was urging capital punishment to be carried out, something that was reserved for the Romans to enact and thus might land him in hot water with the Roman authorities. But to take the opposite position would be to open himself up to accusations that he didn't believe in and uphold the Mosaic law. Well, as Jesus would do so masterfully on many, on many different occasions here, he avoids falling into the trap by simply refusing to directly answer their question. Instead, we read in verse 7 that he stooped down and began writing with his finger on the ground. And of course, the dust in that courtyard area would serve as a perfect chalkboard, for, in effect, for him to write upon. And we're not told what he was writing, and we can only speculate about the content of, of what he is uh, drawing in the dust. And verses 7 and 8, we read that the scribes and the Pharisees persisted in asking him 
what he thought should be done with the woman. They're, they're not happy with the fact he's ignoring their question, and maybe they even interpret his silence as weakness and an inability to answer them. And I suspect that they think they've got him over the proverbial barrel with no way out of this situation, and they continue to press Jesus for an answer. And it's at this point that Jesus, who has been kneeling, stands and looks these guys in their eyes, and his posture is clearly communicating he doesn't fear them. And as he breaks the silence that he's maintained to this point, Jesus now challenges these religious leaders with these words. He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. With a measure of wisdom that surpasses even that of Solomon, Jesus commands the one who is utterly sinless among them to be the first to hurl a stone at her. The Old Testament law, interestingly enough, in Deuteronomy 17, 7, required that the hands of the witnesses to a crime were to be the first in putting that person to death. Now, we don't know if any of these leaders were the actual witnesses of the sin of adultery. Uh, again, the account doesn't tell us that. But Jesus' words would certainly force them to examine their own hearts to see if they were free from condemnation for their own sinful actions. Having spoken these words, his judgment on the matter, Jesus kneels down and once again begins writing in the dust. And this would give his challengers some time to reflect upon what he has said. No further conversation between Jesus and the accusers of this woman are recorded as Jesus continues to write in the dust. Now, some have speculated at this point that Jesus was writing the names of these leaders and their actual sins. I've heard other preachers suggest that maybe he was writing the Ten Commandments. We don't know for sure, of course, what he was writing, but the combination of his words and his writing finally pierced the hearts of these men who had brought the woman before him in an attempt to discredit Jesus. And in verse 9, John informs us that one by one, beginning with the oldest men among them, they filed out. We can speculate here that the older men had either committed a greater quantity of sin during their lifetime or perhaps were more sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit who is convicting of, them, of their own sinfulness than perhaps than the younger men initially experienced. But whatever the precise reason, eventually all of these accusers had filed out, leaving Jesus alone with the woman and with the listeners who had been uh, present to hear his teaching before the religious leaders arrived with her in tow. Now, we read in verse 10 that at this point, Jesus stood to his feet and he addressed the woman. Uh, the author of the Lifeway Teacher's Guide suggests that he does so here, not as her judge, but as her advocate. It's interesting that John will later write in his first epistle these words concerning Jesus's role as our advocate for us when we sin. In 1 John 2, 1, he says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, and that if is, and it surely will happen, if or when anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You've probably heard a preacher at some point state that when Satan accuses us of a sin, Jesus serves as our defense attorney, or our defense attorney, that is, before God, pronouncing our sins forgiven because he paid the price for them on the cross. Now, Jesus speaks to the accused uh, woman, and he calls her woman here. And again, that term might sound a little bit cold to us, but it wasn't considered derogatory or negative at that time. And you might even remember that Jesus addressed his own mother, Mary, uh, by that term woman in John chapter two, verse four, after she had announced to him uh, the, the plight of the host of the wedding who had run out of wine. And Jesus now asked the woman, where are they? Now, clearly he's referencing those who brought her to him uh, after charging her with having committed adultery. He follows that up uh, with another question. Has no one condemned you? I want to suggest to you that that follow-up question, has no one condemned you, serves to reassure her that none are left among those who had denounced her as deserving to die for her sin of adultery. Those who had been clamoring for her death a short time before have now all left the scene left the scene with no one remaining to condemn her. That word condemn here carries with it the idea of not only of invoking the death penalty, but actually carrying it out. Well, the woman responds in verse 11, addressing Jesus with the respectful term, Lord. She confirms what is apparent by the absence of her accusers, saying, no one. Now, the Old Testament law in Deuteronomy 19.15 specifically required multiple witnesses for a death penalty to be enacted against someone who was accused of wrongdoing. It states, a single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed, 
on the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. Having been convicted by Jesus' words and his writing in the dust of their own sinfulness, not even one of these supposed witnesses to the adulterous act remained to accuse or to condemn her. And I suppose that you could argue that Jesus, as the only sinless one pre present in that setting, could have indeed cast the first stone to carry out the death penalty as required by law. But Jesus here is far more interested in redemption and restoration than he was in condemnation. Uh, that harkens back to an early conversation that he had with Nicodemus that I referenced earlier in, in chapter 3, uh, where uh, Jesus utters that most memorized uh, statement of the entire scripture, John 3.16. But he follows that up immediately, that declaration about God's love for the whole word, world, with this statement in verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world or to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And Jesus basically shares that same truth with the woman in verse 10 when he tells her, I do not condemn you either. Now, while he refuses to condemn her sinful actions, he's not excusing or condoning her behavior either. After clarifying he's not condemning her, he quickly goes on to add, go from now on, sin no more. And that command reveals two important truths. Forgiveness doesn't deny the reality of sin, but rather sets aside the penalty for it because it has been atoned for through Christ's, uh, through Christ's sacrificial death for us on the cross. The second truth is the imperative verb here, as Jesus uses it, implies that she's not to continue any longer in that sin, given that Jesus has released her to live in the new freedom that he is giving her. Uh, we're called as well to be agents, or as Paul describes us, ambassadors for Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And in, in that same context, Paul urges us to urge people to be reconciled to God and experience his forgiveness through faith in, in Christ. Now, of course, we don't have the possession, we don't possess the authority or the power to actually forgive folks and to absolve them from the guilt of their sins. That's, that's God's domain and not ours. But we can certainly point others to Christ, introducing them to him so that they might experience his grace and salvation from their sins as well. Well, verse 12 reveals that that original crowd of listeners who had gathered to hear Jesus' teaching still lingered after the woman and her accusers had gone away. And Jesus now redirects his attention to these folks, and he utters another one of those famous I am statements, this time declaring, I am the light of the world. Not only does this I am statement once again draw their attention to God's own use of that phrase in his encounter with Moses identifying himself, but it also is a further claim to be equal with God. In addition, Jesus' claim to be the light of the world underscores how his very presence exposes the sinfulness of humanity. The light reveals the darkness of the human heart as well as the hypocritical nature of his adversaries as well. And in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, Matthew, tax collector turned apostle, explains that Jesus is leaving Nazareth and settling in Capernaum as his new base of operations was a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah. In Isaiah 9, 2, where the prophet writes, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. And John will continue to expound upon that theme of light in his first epistle. He writes this in 1 John 1, verses 5 through 7. This is the message we've heard from him and announced to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. He'll add later in chapter two of that same first epistle, some ethical implications of living in the light versus living in the darkness. When he, he says this in verses eight through 10, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. And the words there echo what Jesus says in our text in verse 12 here. He says that the one who follows him will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of the world. Now, some of the Pharisees who linger in this crowd are present. They challenge Jesus at this point in verse 13 
accusing him once again of testifying about himself and therefore invalidating his own testimony. In the remaining verses of our focal lesson, verses 14 through 18, Jesus will defend himself repeatedly against this charge by first affirming that his own testimony is true because he knows of his own divine origin. He knows where he came from and he knows where he's heading once again when he returns to his heavenly home following his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. Furthermore, he's not alone in testifying of himself, as we've noted repeatedly in the previous chapters as well, when he says the Father testifies to the truth of who I am and the fact that he has sent me into the world to bring about the redemption of humanity. And since we've seen that argument uh, by Jesus on multiple occasions, I, I don't want to belabor that point too much here. I do want to direct your attention to what transpires after this. Though our, our focal lesson ends here with verse 14, what follows in chapter 8 is one of the most gripping and riveting interactions between Jesus and the religious leaders here in Jerusalem as the debate over Jesus' claims to have come from God takes center stage in what remains of this eighth chapter. To those who believe in him, Jesus urges them to continue in his word to be to truly prove themselves to be his disciples. And he promises as they do so, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Just as a quick aside here, those words are over the entrance to one of the main libraries on the University of Texas campus, but they're not quoted as coming from Jesus, nor is the reference John 8, 32 listed. It's as, as if if you come into this library, you'll acquire knowledge that will set you free. And every time I walk by that, I wanted to, to shout out, do you know who said that? Do, do you know who, who spoke those words about true freedom? Now, some in the crowd, and I take these to be adversaries and not those who believe in him, respond by claiming that they are descendants of Abraham. They've never been enslaved, conveniently forgetting, of course, the 400 years of bondage that they pass, uh, that they spent in Egypt. Jesus makes it clear here that he's talking about being a slave to sin in verse 34. Well, the tension continues to mount when they affirm again that they're sons of Abraham. And Jesus tells them, if you really were Abraham's sons, you would do the deeds of Abraham and obey God rather than seeking to kill me. And Jesus tells them instead, they're doing the deeds of their father. Well, that inter introduces a whole new aspect of the conversation. They cast aspersions on Jesus' own birth in verse 41, saying that they're not born of fornication as they implied Jesus was. They, they basically are accusing Jesus of being an illegitimate child. Jesus turns the argument on them in verse uh, 41 and following. He says, you're the sons of the father, your father, the devil, who's the father of lies, who always speaks lies because that's his very nature. They won't believe in God because he's speaking the truth of God. And that statement in turn prompts them to do as others have done previously in verse 48, saying, you're demon possessed and you're a Samaritan. Another swipe at his virgin birth. And again, another accusation that he's an illegitimate child. Jesus' response at this point is to affirm once again that he has come from the Father to seek the glory of God. He dares to say in verse 51 that anyone keeps his word would never see death. Well, that declaration leaves them even further bewildered, and they mock Jesus again, asking, are you greater than Abraham? We know he died. The prophets died. They all experienced death. How, how can you say that the one who believes in you will never die? Jesus continues to argue in verses 54 to 56 that he has come to glorify the Father, and it's the Father that they do not know. And Jesus says that if, they, if, if he were to say that he doesn't know God, he would be a liar just like them. Well, this dramatic scene comes to a climax in verse 56 when Jesus says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he was glad in it. Well, that statement is a is too great a leap for them to ex, to accept, and they mockingly ask how he could possibly have seen Abraham, given that he's not only 50, he's not even yet fifty years old, and Abraham had lived centuries before. Jesus's response to them in verse fifty eight leaves no doubt as to the fact that he is claiming equality with God when he declares with another "I am" statement, "Before Abraham was born, I am." Jesus clearly here is claiming to be the eternal pre-existent Son of God. And that bold declaration isn't missed or misinterpreted by them. They pick up stones to kill him at this point because their actions are showing Jesus is claiming to be equal with God, something that they consider to be blasphemous and deserving of the death sentence. Well, 
I'm convinced you can't read a passage like this and come away from it with a shallow understanding that so many had that Jesus never really claimed to be equal with God. He was just a, a great moral teacher who was uh, speaking enlightened words. He repeatedly, through these I am statements, leaves not a shadow of doubt about his claim to be one with the Father and to have existed from all eternity together with God. I want to conclude our, our Bible study this evening with one of my favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis about Jesus' own emphatic assertion that he is indeed God. He writes this in his book, Mere Christianity. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Thanks for joining me this evening. And I pray that uh, God's word will both challenge and enlighten us as we uh, ponder the application of it to our hearts this evening. I invite you to pray with me as we wrap up our lesson. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the audacity, the boldness with which Jesus over and over again claimed to be one with you, claimed to be God himself in the flesh, having come into this world to live a sinless, perfect life, to die on the cross for our sins. May we honor him as such. May we boldly live for him this week is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Look forward to seeing you this coming Lord's Day. God bless you for now. Bye.